The Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Be seated, please. As you've just witnessed, the fourth Advent candle is now lit. In just seven days, Christmas will be upon us. Ready or not, we will meet our Lord as he comes to us again as a baby. And we continue to meet him at so many times and in so many ways. But in the meantime, we prepare for what God is going to do. I want to share with you this morning some exceptional insights from James Liggett. Because in lining up our lessons from the first lit reading from 2 Samuel with our gospel today, he notes that these are very different stories about very different people. And they include, as you heard in the first lesson, King David, and in the gospel, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And yet, in a strange way, they are saying the same thing. Let's look first at King David. The reading from 2 Samuel begins historically back around the year 995 BCE. And David has always been an ambitious fellow with big, big plans. And by now, many of those plans have already been accomplished. He's just been crowned king of all of Israel. He had conquered Jerusalem and made that his capital city. He had unified the various political factions in the nation, and he had now won enough battles to make his whole kingdom, the north and the south, secure. He's also built himself a new palace. And now David figures, well, he should build God something as well. And so he's going to build God a house, just for God, this unique, special, gorgeous temple that will be just God's own place. If you think about it, though, this temple is as much about King David as it is about the God to whom it is dedicated. David has lots of big plans. And so the verses we just heard from 2 Samuel are kind of a surprising response by God to David's plans because, interestingly, God doesn't say, that's a great idea, let's go for it, David. No, he declines the whole thing. And he comes up with his own alternative. He basically says, God, I am God, and, and you don't need to build me a house. I haven't needed a house all these years. I'm quite fine, thank you. But David, you can be a part of my plans. And so God is going to do something rather remarkable for David. God is going to create from David and David's lineage 
a whole different kind of house, a dynasty, if you will, through which, he says, salvation will come to all people. Mysteriously, therefore, David's plans are coming full circle because God's plans are for all creation, and they begin here with David, but they don't end there. David is credited for a lot of things, of course, throughout the Old Testament, lifted up as kind of the, 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 the pinnacle of leadership of Israel. But for all the things that we think about and remember and credit David for, it's not this event, and certainly not for his attempt to build God a pretty cathedral. No, the most important thing about David was his willingness to listen. And in effect, out of that listening then, to honor God and to let God be God, and in effect then, to surrender his grand plans. And so David humbly walks away from the future he had outlined, his plans, and into this marvelous, unexpected future that God had in store. That's a lot harder. Now, almost a thousand years later, we find Mary in a similar but different situation. She was a young woman of respectable family. She was destined, as we know, to be the wife of a skilled craftsman, Joseph. She would probably make her niche in this tiny middle class of Palestine. And her plans in life were quite humble, quite meager. They included, no doubt, a quiet life a family, incorporating children and, and good health, and, and perhaps even a little comfort. She would keep the commandments, as her family did, and she would live by them. And yet, for all of her meager plans, God comes along through the angel Gabriel and announces no to those plans. Mary, in fact, will have very little of what she ever hoped for, because God has very specific plans for Mary. These plans are quite unexpected, as you know, but even scandalous. And they are going to change everything, not just for Mary, but for the world. Because through her, this dynasty begun in David would now be fulfilled. And the salvation that was offered to David and to Mary would be offered to all people. And so the key to Mary's greatness, and there are many things we think of in that line, when we hear all generations will call her blessed. But at the very top of them is her ability, like David's, to listen. To hear the voice of God and then say, let it be to me according to your word. Mary agreed to walk away from this future she had outlined, again, into this unknown future that God had offered her. And again, it was very hard it would be for any of us. Now, you no doubt have some plans for Christmas and the days and the months beyond. These plans, I can only assume, include God in some way. Today's readings remind us again, quite starkly, that God has plans for us as well. That God is often most real when things in our lives, in fact, do not go as we had planned. Like David and Mary, one of the things that we give up is absolute authority and control over all of our so-called plans in life. As people of faith, we too promise to listen and then to let God say no, even to our best plans for ourselves and for God. Now don't misunderstand. Making plans for our lives and for our future are very important. We are created in the image of God to live freely, and the use of that freedom then to live that out responsibly. And of course that includes making plans and following through with them. But at the same time, Advent again today reminds us that God's business is quite different from our business as usual. There is no doubt that the hardest task we often face in life is to be open to and accepting of God's plans, and all the changes that brings wherever God leads us. And yet we know that those tasks, those changes, can be among the richest and most rewarding. What will your Christmas look like this year? What will it look like for the Lord to reborn, be reborn in you again? 
Now, we don't know, because again, we can't exactly plan for it. But like David and like Mary, we can be open to it, seeking both the grace to listen and the faith to respond, that we too might allow the wonder of David and Mary to continue in us. Let us pray. Lord, you know how we love to make plans. And you know how upset we become when they fall through. Lord, help us to be less insistent on our plans and more open to the mystery of yours. Open our hearts, our eyes, our ears, again to the mystery of the Spirit, as we too are called forth to listen and to respond. May our plans always include you, Lord, and always include an openness and a willingness to hear and to follow. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.